On August 2nd, 1971, Dave Scott performed a little televised experiment during the third lunar EVA of the Apollo 15 mission. Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Okay. Yeah, I've got a, a good picture there. I've got the... Beautiful picture, Dave. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Bye, bye. That proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. That was only the capstone on an intense and successful mission. Apollo 15 was launched on July 26, 1971, carrying Commander Dave Scott, who was on his third and last space flight, having also flown on Gemini 8 and Apollo 9, Command Module Pilot Al Warden on his first and only space flight, and Lunar Module Pilot James Irwin, also on his first and only space flight. More so than any Apollo crew before them, they had been trained for geological field work, so they knew what to look for, what rocks to pick up and bring back from their landing location near Hadley Reel on the moon. Command Module Pilot Al Warden, who would stay in orbit, learned how to make geological observations from altitude by doing so in an airplane at a simulated speed to simulate how fast he would be passing over locations on the moon. Meanwhile, Dave Scott and James Owen trained with Leon Silver, a Caltech geologist who was interested in the early history of the Earth and the Moon. This training would allow them to find a 4.1 billion year old rock on the Moon, dubbed the Genesis Rock. This was the first mission that would get to use the lunar rover, so the additional training meant that they would get to put it to even better use than otherwise would have been the case. Their schedule was grueling. On July 31st, they did a 6-hour and 32-minute EVA. On August 1st, they were out and about for 7 hours and 12 minutes. And finally, on EVA 3, uh, which also had the Galileo's right experiment uh, occurring on August 2nd, they were out for 4 hours and 49 minutes. That's a total of more than 18 hours in 3 days walking and driving on the moon. Al Warden, the command module pilot, would also get a special EVA on the way back to Earth, the first ever EVA performed beyond low Earth orbit, to retrieve some film cassettes and to check on the cause of some instrument malfunctions. As if all this wasn't enough, Apollo 15 also released a sub-satellite in lunar orbit to investigate the Moon's gravitational field and magnetosphere. Compared to all of their activities around and on the Moon, the launch of Apollo 15 on its Saturn V was rather mundane. But uh, here it is anyway, with the audio from July 26th. I retained all the audio through the first stage burnout, but edited the remainder for brevity. T-minus 60 seconds and counting on Apollo 15. The astronauts are go, launch vehicle and spacecraft components all go as our countdown proceeds. Now 50 seconds, we have the power transfer. The vehicle now on the battery power on the vehicle, and all is still going well. Lunar Module Pilot Jim Irwin making some final checks, now passing the 40-second mark. Spacecraft Commander Dave Scott now has made his final check, that is, aligning the guidance system. 30 seconds and counting. The guidance system will go internal at the 17-second mark. Now 25 seconds. We have complete clearance to launch. We are go. 20. 15 seconds, guidance internal, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all engines running, launch commit, liftoff, we have liftoff at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The tower is clear. And we have a roll program. Thank you. You have good thrust on all five engines. Thanks, Gordo. Roll complete. 
Roger. And we have a search program. Roger. Stand by for mode one Bravo. Mark one Bravo. Roger, one Bravo. Booster Systems Engineer reports to Flight Director that S1C stays looking good. Houston, everything looks uh, perfect down here. Okay, looks smooth up here, Gordo. Going through maximum dynamic pressure at this time. Nine miles downrange, 13, 14.5 miles height. Charlie, mark one Charlie now. Roger, one Charlie. Each of the S1Cs. Roger. Each of the five S1C engines gulping three tons of fuel per second. Inboard. That's your inboard. Dynamics reports go for stadium. Good stage. Roger. That's being used. You have good thrust on the S2. All five are good. Okay. Fire jet. Roger. We confirm the skirt set. Your mode two. Roger. Mode two. Roger. I'm coming up on 10,000 feet per second mark. Downrange 131, altitude 66. Left in Houston at four. The guidance uh, has converged. The CMC is go. Everything looks good. Okay, go. Let's get up here. Now at 35% of the velocity needed to orbit. Downrange 190 miles, altitude 79. 15 Houston, five minutes. Everything looks nominal. Your go. Okay, good. Thank you. Looks good up here. 40% of velocity needed. Roger. Predicting nominal shutdown on the S2 stage. Ten times are nominal. A level sense arm will be eight plus three four, and S two cutoff at niner plus zero niner. Over. Uh, Roger eight plus three four and nine plus zero nine. And stand by for S four B to C O I. Mark, you have S four B to C O I now. Roger S four B to C O I. Stand by for S four B to orbit capability. Mark, you have it now. Roger S four B to orbit. Downrange 479, altitude 96, now approaching 65% of the velocity needed for orbit. Velocity now 16,700 feet per second. Official time of liftoff 34 minutes, 00, zero seconds point seven nine. Downrange 660 miles, altitude 95 miles. 78% velocity required for orbit. 15 years from here, Ed. 15 years from here. Go ahead, Ed. I'll say again, 15. Houston, 15, we didn't call. You got something? 
Uh, you've had PO shift and the uh, thrust looks good. Okay. You've had level sent time now? Roger. About six seconds to staging. Stand by for mode four capability. Mark, you have mode four now. Roger, in a good stage. Roger. Booster reports thrust okay on the S4B stage. And you've had, uh, you have good thrust on the S4B. Roger. Nine hundred sixty miles downrange, ninety four point seven altitude, velocity twenty three thousand two hundred thirty. Fifteen Houston, everything's looking uh, perfect. Uh, predicted cutoff time one one plus three seven. Over. Uh, Roger one one plus three seven. Twelve eighty one miles downrange, ninety three point four altitude. 97% of velocity, 98% of velocity required, 25,143 feet per second. Okay, cut off, 1-1 one, one plus 3-4. Roger. Booster confirms the S-4B has shut down. Okay, Houston, uh, gimbal motors are off, and the uh, S-4B oxidizer is 4-0, and the fuel is about 3-1. I just 4-0 and 3-1. Roger, Houston, uh, gimbal motors are off, and the fuel is about 3-1. Okay, Gordo, we got ourselves in a 93.7 by 88.9, shut down on a VI of plus 25595, H dot plus 0008, altitude plus 00932. Roger, out, copy. Uh, 15 Houston, uh, IU shows you in a 92.5 by 91.5. Radar confirms that, and the booster is safe. Okay, Gordo, good job. It was a very smooth ride all the way. Roger. After a couple of hours in orbit, Apollo 15 went for TLI, translunar injection, <laughs> pushing itself to the moon, first selling the fuel down, and then lighting its third stage, the J-2 engine on its third stage. Soon after that burn was complete, the command module separated from the rest of the craft, moved itself a little bit forward, and then it would flip around and redock with the lunar module, and then eventually pull the lunar module out of the third stage and proceed on its way to the moon. The third stage, the S-4B stage, of course is also on its way to the moon and uh, they will be crashing it into the moon to get some seismic measurements. And here we have a great image of the craft getting further and further away from the Earth and of course on the flip side getting closer and closer to the moon. Once close to periapsis around the moon, the service module engine was lit in order to get the craft into orbit around the moon. Apollo 15 made orbit around the moon on July 29th, 1971, and then the lunar module undocked with the command service module on July 30th, and then made its way down to the surface. So the lunar lander would land on July 30th. They would do a brief little uh, pop out of the hatch to make sure everything was all right. And then the EVAs were July 31st, August 1st, and August 2nd. So they spent quite a while on the moon. Uh, here is the descent of the lunar module uh, named Falcon. Now up to this point I haven't actually recorded one of my Apollo landings solely from the outside in this sort of cinematic view uh, controlling it through uh, Telemachus uh, so I'm controlling it through uh, basically another window. Uh, so you'll forgive me for giving an extended presentation of this particular landing. Uh, for the Apollo tribute mission I did from inside the lunar module so I didn't get these external views of the whole process. Um, the RCS had to fire quite a lot in order to keep 
the craft stable, probably more than was actually necessary for the original mission. Uh, for some reason I had some sort of mass unbalance or something like that, or the descent engine was not gimbling properly. So I was having a little bit of trouble controlling it, and I was a little bit more adventurous than I, I remember it being in the past. I don't know what was up with that, but in any case, uh, here we have the lunar module descending to the surface, cutting the horizontal velocity, and ultimately coming to the final phase of the descent uh, straight down. And here we go for the last few hundred meters here. The lunar descent engine, unlike most rocket engines, is deeply throttleable. So uh, you can bring it down to a fraction of its total thrust. Most engines are basically either on or off and have limited restarts. The descent engine is very flexible in that respect and uh, that was real handy in this case. Here we go and waiting for the shadow. And there's the shadow. A little bit more horizontal component than I would have liked, but uh, trying to control it at this point was very difficult. You wouldn't want to tip it over or do anything drastic. And so, could use a little bit of RCS, but the RCS seems to be doing all it can just to keep the thing stable, so... There we go, and... We have contact, and touchdown! From here on in the video, I'll present some highlights from the television broadcasts of the EVAs, which were extensive hours and hours of TV broadcasts of the EVAs. And so let's see some highlights from those. Dave, an extraordinary television picture here. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at its greatest. There's so, many, so much uh, hummocky ground around here, we're on a slope of probably about 10 degrees. And uh, the left rear foot pad is probably about two feet lower than the right rear foot pad. And the uh, left front's a little low too. But the limb looks like it's in good shape. The rover is in good shape. Well, the program manager, I guess I got his engine bill. <laughs> It's a little uh, rise right under the center of the limb. The uh, rear legs on a crater, and the and the uh, rim of the crater is right uh, underneath the engine bell. Sorry about that, Jim, but uh, I have our landage, you know. Okay. There he's just set it right in the crater. Joe, Max, C is going on the 16 millimeter. Uh, Max, Charlie? Charlie. Okay, Joe, that ought to do it for your TV, I hope. Dave, we're uh, happy. It looks good. Okay, Jim, let's take a look at our rover friend here. Watch that TV cable, man, that's really good. Uh, Again, is that right? 
They're supposed to be in lockdown, Dave. That point? Roger, Dave. Perfect. Let's see out here. I have to see Bill through now. I have to see when you get off. 
And Dave, uh, you're turning our TV off now, yes? Uh, Dave, this is Houston. Uh, we assume uh, you're going to turn our TV off shortly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Joe. Oh, boy, look at the bottom of that, Jim. All glassy, isn't it? Yeah, oh, glass all over the bottom of that one. And it looks like another microbrecha. And I don't see any uh, pits in any of these at all. I'll, I do see a couple of glass, yeah, there, this one's got a couple of very small glass filled pits, but most of them are pitless. Yeah, hey, 190. Roger, 190. Typical. Okay, Joe, I took the down sun from a different side on this one. I mean, the cross sun from a different side on this one. If you want to ward that. Okay, you want to stick that in my bag? And let's go down and take a look at this little crater right here. There's a little small crater, I guess you could see, Joe, at about uh, 2 o'clock to the TV now. And uh, I'm having trouble getting up with that. See those linear features on Hadley, Dave? Do you get a chance to I did. look up there? On Mount Hadley? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My word. Look at their dipping uh, to the northwest, right? Right, that's what I said. Oh, yeah. It's a big, looks like a big block uh, tilted up on its side. Just like you call it, Jim, and we're going to ask for 500 millimeter pictures of that when you get back to the rover. Dave, we want you to head towards Station 4, and we'll advise you on... Uh, what your rate looks like and the tasks that uh, we want you to carry out once you arrive. Just start off in the direction of Station 4, please. Dave, give me a hand. I can see it over there, Dave. Yeah. I see about uh, 330. But you, that's not going to mean much to you until you get down to the level. That's right. And the camera's running, Joe. Okay, and standing by for a mark when, you're, when you roll. Four, four, four. Roger. Hey, your camera. Camera's loose on a swivel, Jim. No, I'm feeling a pan here. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, it's an awful fast pan. I just wanted to make sure it was running. Dave, you'll want to trend or uh, course 346, and it's about 1.7 clicks to station. Okay. I'm going to go down sort of slow here, Joe, just to make sure we uh, play it cool. I just have the camera running, Joe. Remind me to turn it off when it runs out of film. Yes, sir. I've got a hack. About half a mag on it. Roger. And you're running at uh, 12 frames per second, I imagine. Yeah. Right. But we're going down soon. I just took some... Down soon ain't going to be very good on the photography, Joe. It's, uh, the zero phase just washes out completely. No problem, Dave. Uh, Jim might want to swing the camera around towards the right. Uh, we're, we're heading directly downhill now. We're across them. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking out at the. Uh, are we looking at the the big crater dead ahead? Is Dune? Yeah. Yeah. That should be Dune. We want to hit the uh, southern southwest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But again, that's uh, you know we didn't see the uh, the levee or rampart on the eastern side. No, we sure didn't. So, uh, probably any place on the southern rim would be good. And there was a lot more video where that came from, largely thanks to the fact that after TV camera mishaps on previous missions, Mission Control decided to take direct control over the rover camera. And that also led to this, the first ever launch of the Ascent module captured by a camera. And so here we will see the launch of the Ascent module back up into orbit. Uh, later on, they, will, they would have the camera track the ascent module properly they didn't have that quite right just yet and so we'll see it lift off but the camera won't track it as far as it could the only serious mishap on this mission occurred on august 7th on the day it was supposed to splash down in the pacific ocean when one of its parachutes failed to inflate fortunately the command module is designed so that it only required two of the parachutes in order to splash down safely 
Thank you for watching this presentation of Today in Space History for August 2nd, the Apollo 15 mission, Galileo was right, and special thanks to Frizank for the Apollo Saturn model used in this video.